podcast is a production of Widener Law Commonwealth in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. For more information, visit commonwealthlaw.widener.edu slash podcast. Now here's your host, Julie Massing. Welcome everybody to the Widener Law Commonwealth podcast. Today we are here with Professor Michael Domino. He is going to talk to us a little bit about the Supreme Court of the United States. Uh, welcome. Thank you, Julie. Yep. And um, can you just start by giving us a little bit of background and history about the Supreme Court of the United States? Sure. The Supreme Court was created as part of the Constitution. The framers decided that rather than have multiple high courts, one court for one type of cases, one type for a different type of cases, instead we would create one Supreme Court that would be supreme in cases of law and equity. Uh, It Its primary responsibility is to interpret federal law, including the federal constitution. We have, of course, Supreme Courts in each of the states that are primarily responsible for interpreting state law, but the Supreme Court of the United States remains supreme in all matters of interpretation of federal law, including, and most especially, the U.S. Constitution. Okay. Um, And I just wanted to get into a little bit about the theories of constitutional interpretation and how they influence the rulings of the Supreme Court. The theories of constitutional interpretation are probably the most essential thing that I try to teach my students in constitutional law. Rather than focus on individual rulings, is there a constitutional right to do X or Y, they're apt to learn much more about the Constitution and the Supreme Court and constitutional law generally if they understand what the justices are trying to figure out. And there are two major divisions in theories of constitutional interpretation between justices and academics and others who believe the Constitution has a static meaning, an enduring meaning that doesn't change over time, and those who adopt a living Constitution theory, one who believes that the constitutional meaning does change. In the first group, the people who believe that the Constitution has a static meaning, we tend to call them originalists. That means that the Constitution's meaning is that meaning that it originally had when it was written. Now, for these originalists, constitutional meaning can change if the Constitution itself changes. We have an amendment process that's put out in Article 5 of the Constitution, And if you're not happy with something that's in the Constitution, you can change it. And that's been done 27 times. For example, the 13th Amendment was ratified immediately after the Civil War and banned slavery. So the initial Constitution didn't ban slavery. The country decided after the Civil War it's a good idea to ban slavery. And so the Constitution was amended, and the constitutional meaning then changes. But these originalists would say, unless the Constitution itself is amended the constitutional meaning stays the same. So, for example, if it wasn't cruel and unusual punishment back when the Eighth Amendment was written Mm -hmm. to execute someone, if capital punishment was constitutional in 1791, then it remains constitutional today. The meaning of cruel and unusual just stays the same until the constitutional document is changed. A living constitutionalist, on the other hand, says, well, society has changed, And therefore, it's a good idea to change the meaning of the Constitution to keep it updated with the times. So maybe we didn't recognize that capital punishment was cruel and unusual in the 18th century, but maybe it has become cruel and unusual. Or perhaps there wasn't a constitutional right to abortion back in the middle of the 19th century, but maybe there has developed one or there wasn't a right to gay marriage back when the 14th Amendment was written and ratified, but maybe our idea of constitutional meaning has changed. This is a fundamental divide between people of of different views of interpreting the Constitution. Conservatives tend to be originalists, Mm -hmm. or at least they tend to characterize themselves as originalists. They say the Constitution means what the Constitution has always meant, and you shouldn't be able to change constitutional meaning just by getting a majority of the Supreme Court that thinks that the Constitution should be changed. Liberals, on the other hand, tend to like the expansion of constitutional rights that comes with the living constitutional theory, and so they like to uh, adopt a changing view of the Constitution, a view of the Constitution that allows for rights expansion over time. 
Okay. Um, and I guess of the justices that are that are currently on the court, is it pretty much split? Is it you know are there ones that look at it? Can you give me an overview of of kind of the justices that are currently on the court? Are some originalists or some more liberal? Is that yes? I'd be happy to the. What I've given you so far, this division between originalists and non-originalists or living constitutionalists, is a bit of an oversimplification. Okay. Actual people tend to have a mix of those views. Okay. Justice Thomas on the current court is the one who is most in line with originalism. He's the one who tends to adhere to an original meaning of the Constitution most consistently. On the other hand, the justices who are most identified as liberals the Obama appointees and the Clinton appointees, those are are more willing to be forthright in accepting the idea of a living constitution that changes over time. Some of the other justices, the moderates and moderate conservatives, Justices Alito, Roberts, Kennedy, uh, for example, they, they have leanings toward originalism. They will make originalist arguments, but they won't be as doctrinaire about it as Justice Thomas will. Sometimes those justices will allow for changed constitutional meaning, particularly if there is an existing precedent that has moved the constitutional meaning from what it originally was. So all justices are at different places along that spectrum between originalism and living constitutionalism, and some make greater or lesser concessions based on what the precedent from the Supreme Court has already said. Okay. And um, as we kind of start to talk about the justices, um, can we talk a little bit about how somebody gets appointed to the Supreme Court of the United States um, uh, and tell me about the nomination process and how how people are chosen for that? The nomination process for the Supreme Court is the same as the nomination process for every other federal judgeship and for plenty of other federal appointments as well. The president nominates the individual that he wants to take a seat on the Supreme Court, and the Senate has the option of confirming that nominee or voting that nominee down. The constitutional phrase is advice and consent. That the person is appointed to the Supreme Court if nominated by the president and the Senate gives its advice and consent. And what that means is the Senate has to have a majority vote in favor of the nominee. So if the president nominates and a majority of the Senate votes to confirm the nominee, then the person takes a seat on the Supreme Court. Um, and now, with the death of Antonin Scalia, that left a vacancy, of course, on the Supreme Court. Um, and, um, you know, President Obama, at the time, he did ha- have a nomination, but that didn't really go anywhere. Can you explain what happened in that process and why nothing happened with moving that, that nominee forward in that process? President Obama nominated Merrick Garland, a judge on the D.C. Circuit, mm-hmm. to take the spot that was vacated by Justice Scalia. But at the time, the U.S. Senate was controlled by the Republican Party. And because the Republicans weren't going to be satisfied with a nominee that President Obama nominated, they decided to hold off on holding hearings for that nomination. And instead, they gambled. They said, we have a chance of winning the election, the presidential election in the fall. Mm -hmm. And if a Republican wins that presidential election then the nominee that that president makes will be much more to our liking than this one that President Obama has nominated. Now, some people think that, well, judges should just apply the law, and it shouldn't really matter as long as you have a qualified nominee, someone who is talented and can read the law well and is experienced and knows what he's doing, that it really shouldn't make all that much of a difference what judge, what individual judge you place on the court. But the fact of the matter is, for reasons that that we've just explained, these differences in constitutional interpretation, it does make a huge difference which kind of person is placed on the Supreme Court. Justices can be very qualified but have very different philosophies about how the Constitution should be interpreted. And so the result is that it could make a huge difference in terms of what rights are protected, what limitations are placed on the power of one branch of government or of government entirely, what the relationship is between the federal government and the states. Tons of questions that matter to a lot of people could turn out very differently Mm -hmm. if you pick 
a qualified liberal nominee as opposed to a qualified conservative nominee. And so when President Obama nominated Judge Garland, the Republicans in the Senate said, Judge Garland may be a very nice guy, he may be a very qualified guy, and there, there wasn't really any debate as to either of those questions. Mm -hmm. But still, the Republicans thought he's apt to decide cases in a way that we don't like. Mm -hmm. And we would be better off from our, our political position uh, we would be better off having a Supreme Court with a justice that was more conservative than Judge Garland. And President Obama thought the same thing in reverse. The reason that he nominated a judge who was on the liberal side, he wasn't the most liberal choice that could have been made, but he was certainly more liberal than the Republicans wanted. Mm -hmm. The reason that President Obama chose him was because President Obama wanted a court that would decide cases in a liberal direction. Mm -hmm. And so it turns out that the Republicans' gamble did pay off. They didn't hold hearings on Judge Garland, so Judge Garland was not confirmed and never took a seat on the Supreme Court. Instead, uh, President Trump won the election in November, took office in January, and nominated Judge Garland, mm -hmm. who was confirmed by the still Republican Senate and has now taken his seat on the Supreme Court. He's expected to be, although nobody knows for sure, he's expected to be more conservative than Judge Garland would have been. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and, and, and as you touched on, you know, with the appointment of uh, Neil Gorsuch, um, of course, that's gotten a lot of press, like like something like that would, but um, and it has a lot of people paying attention. Um, well, how do you think, with him being a little more conservative, what do you expect some of the opinions to come out of the court to look like in the future and, and I know it's it, you could never fill the shoes of Antonin Scalia, Justice Scalia. But um, you know, what? How is that going to look in the future? Um, I think the appointment of Judge Gorsuch keeps the Supreme Court as it was. The most people are looking at the appointment as trading one conservative for another. Justice Scalia was an icon. He he was well known mm -hmm. within legal circles and beyond. He did a great deal to galvanize the conservative legal movement in the country. But in terms of the way that his decisions came out, I don't think there's going to be terribly much difference between his decisions and uh, now Justice Gorsuch's decisions. It would have been a significant change to take his Scalia's conservative seat and replace him with a more liberal justice like President Obama wanted. So we trade one conservative for another. We keep the Supreme Court as it is with four relative conservatives, four relative liberals, and Justice Kennedy in the middle. However, the next vacancy mm -hmm. could be very significant. Okay. If the next vacancy on the Supreme Court is either Justice Kennedy or one of the four liberals, and President Trump is able to name a replacement and move the court in a more conservative direction, then the the Supreme Court decisions will tend to shift. Whereas before, you got a lot of 5-4 decisions that went in a liberal direction, most notably, I suppose, the gay marriage ruling. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if President Trump is able to replace one of those liberals or the moderate with a solid conservative, then the Supreme Court will be more predictably conservative. Of course, that depends on there being a vacancy over the next three years or so. And, and nobody knows whether that will will come to pass. I was just going to ask, what is the um, probability that there would be a vacancy within, you know, the next three years? Uh, I mean, the, what is the retirement age for? Is there a mandatory retirement age for the for the justices? No, all federal judges serve a term of what's called in the Constitution good behavior, which means that they serve for life unless they voluntarily decide to step down or they're impeached mm -hmm. for high crimes or misdemeanors. Okay. And we haven't had a successful impeachment in the court's history, and we don't expect any. The, uh, the he history has been that justices like to try to be replaced by people who have similar ideologies. So relatively liberal Justices Souter and Stevens mm -hmm. waited until President Obama was in office, and then they left, voluntarily left the court. Justice O'Connor decided to leave the court during George W. Bush's term in office to be replaced by a fairly conservative okay. justice. And so I would expect that none of the four liberals on the court 
will leave voluntarily during President Trump's term in office. Mm -hmm. They might be forced to if health concerns or otherwise uh, make it impossible for them to continue to serve. Um, Justice Scalia Mm -hmm. died in office during President Obama's term, though that certainly wouldn't have been his preference to leave during a Democratic administration. Mm -hmm. So I think in terms of, of anticipating a vacancy from one of those four, it will be just the... The luck of the draw. Kind of. Or, or unluck of the draw if right. you're uh, the person who's suffering the health problems yes, that would force leaving. you to vacate the court. Uh, the, so the, only, the only one I see that would, would likely leave the court voluntarily during President Trump's term in office would be Justice Kennedy. Okay. And he, I have no information about this other than that he's been on the court for quite a while mm-hmm. and that he's, he's uh, relatively old, though he's not the most... Uh, elderly justice who's on the court, but he might very well decide to step down voluntarily sometime over the next three years. Okay. As our listeners know, I always like to end on kind of a fun note with uh, things. So can you just tell us what are some of your fun extra extracurricular activities outside of, of teaching law? What do you like to do? I am a hockey referee and a baseball umpire. Okay. So the the idea of dealing with rules and applying rules to situations is a, a, a theme common to a lot of different aspects of my life, I guess. I've been doing both since I was a teenager, and in fact, uh, both my sons have followed in my footsteps Very now. Nice. One of them is is a baseball umpire with me, and we've done games together, and the other one referees hockey with me. And do you do that locally in, in the central Pennsylvania area, or do you travel elsewhere to do that? I travel a couple of hours here and there, but most of my games are around here. Okay, and do you have home teams? Who's your your favorite sports teams? Well, I grew up in Buffalo. Okay. So I tend to root for the Bills and the Sabres, which gives me considerable angst every <laughs> year. Uh, that's my, those are the teams that I root for. Okay, well, great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, and uh, it was great. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Please look for more podcasts coming up in the future. And also, we will most likely have Professor Domino back in at the end of uh, June to give us a wrap-up of the Supreme Court cases. Thank you. Widener University Commonwealth Law School is the Pennsylvania capital's only law school. With three specialized centers of legal scholarship through its Law and Government Institute, Environmental Law and Sustainability Center, and Business Advising Program, Widener Law Commonwealth offers an exceptional learning experience that is personal, practical, and professional. Visit commonwealthlaw.widener.edu for more information.